Hi there, Allison here with another Cap Franc du Jour. Today we are in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, Canada, and we're looking at the Synchromesh Wines 2016 Turtle Rock Farms Vineyard Cabernet Franc. Synchromesh Wines is a family winery in the truest sense of the word. Alan and Amy Dickinson purchased their first five acre vineyard back in 2010. And since then, Alan's parents have joined the business as well, and now they're farming around 50 hectares of vines, primarily in Okanagan Falls, with a couple of vineyard blocks as well on the Naramata bench in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia. The primary focus of the winery is Riesling, but they are working around five acres, that's about two hectares of Cabernet Franc vines. And this is a grape that Alan is quite passionate about. In fact, it was Olga Raffaut's Late Picasse that was the wine that first connected us when we first started chatting back in 2020. I have done a number of videos featuring uh, Cabernet Francs from Ontario, but this is the first video looking at a Cabernet Franc from British Columbia. So let me give you an overview of the wine landscape here. Currently, there's around 4,486 hectares of vines planted across nine official regions in southern British Columbia. And as a point of comparison, in Ontario, there's around 6,900 uh, hectares under vine here. And to uh, put these two regions into perspective, in the Loire Valley alone, there's around 41,800 hectares under vine. And in Chile, there is just over 40,000 hectares of just Cabernet Sauvignon planted there. So yes, Canada is a very large country, but in terms of wine production, uh, it is very, really quite, quite small. And that's because the uh, areas that are viable for viticulture are really quite limited. And Cabernet Franc in British Columbia, it is an important grape variety. There's uh, currently around uh, 720 uh, acres, that's about 290 uh, hectares of Cabernet Franc vines planted. And that makes it the fourth most planted red grape variety. And as I mentioned, there are nine official regions in British Columbia, but the largest and the most important in terms of volume is the Okanagan Valley. Currently, there's around uh, 9,600 acres. It's about 3,900 uh, hectares of vines planted here. And that represents actually about 86% of the vine plantings in the province. Now, the Okanagan Valley, in terms of its growing environment, it is extreme. Here, the vineyard area is dotted along a series of glacial lakes, with Lake Okanagan being the most important uh, of these lakes. And as I said, the vineyard area is dotted along this winding stretch of land that uh, stretches about 250 kilometers from north to south, uh, with the town of Vernon in the north, the town of Osoyoos in the south, and Osoyoos is actually uh, just about three kilometers north of the U.S. border, where uh, British Columbia meets Washington State. And here we are really at the uh, northern limit for uh, viability for Vitis vinifera varieties in terms of latitude. We're at about 49 to 50 degrees north latitude. And here the climate would be characterized as cool climate, but we are dealing with some major extremes in terms of temperature shifts uh, during the year as well as during the growing season. Uh, the growing season actually would be characterized as short and hot, and it is not uncommon for uh, temperatures in the summertime to reach 40 uh, degrees Celsius. But because of uh, altitude, because of latitude here, and the influence of the mountains, uh, the temperatures typically dip in the evening to 12, 15 degrees. So we have that wide diurnal range in temperatures, and this of course will help to slow down ripening, extend the growing season, and preserve acidities. What's more is in the winter time, uh, temperatures can dip to as cold as minus 20 degrees Celsius. And that is certainly a limiting factor here as far as what grape varieties will survive uh, and work well in this, uh, in this particular region. Now, another important element to the growing environment here is we are in the rain shadow of the coastal mountain range, and this will block out the precipitation from the Pacific Ocean. So we experience a relatively low rainfall here in the Okanagan Valley. Typically, there's a little higher rainfall in the northern part of the region, and then as you move south, it gets drier and drier. In fact, almost desert-like conditions in the southern Okanagan Valley. But uh, the fact that we have low rainfall coupled with this higher latitude means that we experience a lot of sunshine here. So high number of sunshine hours during the growing season. And then in terms of soils, there are a lot of different soils that we find over this large area. Uh, but in terms of them in general, we would characterize them as being glacially derived soils. We have granitic based soils, we have soils of uh, volcanic origin, there's some silty loam, uh, lake or river derived soils, there's uh, also some calcareous soils here as well. 
And really, uh, what is really important to note, I would say, about this region and, and the point that I kind of want to drill home, and if there was one major takeaway as far as the Okanagan Valley is concerned, this would be it, is that we are dealing with a very large area, as I said, 250 kilometers from north to south. And there are a lot of factors here that influence the microclimates of the vineyards, or mesoclimates of the vineyards, I should say. We have the mountains here, we have uh, different altitudes of the vineyards, we have the lakes, which lake are you on, what side of the lake you're on in terms of your exposures. Uh, so all of these come into play. So there is a lot of variability in terms of mesoclimates and soils from vineyard to vineyard. And that really makes site selection quite critical here. And it is not uncommon actually to find uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir for sparkling wine production planted very close, a few hundred meters, a couple of kilometers away from a vineyard that is actually better suited to fuller bodied uh, Bordeaux blends uh, or Syrah even. So there is a lot of experimentation happening here uh, in the Okanagan in terms of grape varieties. Uh, there's currently over 80 different grape varieties planted here. But to drill down even further to today's wine, the Turtle Rock Farms Vineyard is located in the Naramata Bench, and this is the uh, one of four official sub-GIs of the Okanagan Valley that has been delineated by soil and microclimate characteristics. The vineyard area here is dotted along the eastern uh, shoreline, the eastern side of Lake Okanagan, and it starts at around Penticton and uh, stretches north about 15 kilometers. And then it's about, I would say, 500 to about 1,500 meters wide uh, inland from the shoreline. And in terms of the vineyard areas, they typically will have a western facing exposure, so they're getting the benefit of the afternoon sunshine. And of course, the lakes play, or the lake, I should say, plays in a very important role in terms of moderating the climate here. The lake will help to uh, slow down, or I should say, delay uh, bud break in the springtime. It will also help to extend the growing season in the fall. And also, the lake serves to help. Uh, it actually helps to reflect the sunshine into the vineyards, and this will help with photosynthesis, photosynthesis as well as uh, ripening. The vineyard areas are typically at an elevation of about 380 to 490 meters above sea level, so we do see that a wider diurnal range in temperatures, typically around uh, 30 degrees Celsius difference between daytime and nighttime temperatures. And in terms of rainfall here, uh, we're about 360 millimeters of rainfall. So again, high number of sunshine hours here as well. And in terms of soils, they've actually identified 10 different groups of soils. But generally speaking, on the gentler slopes closer to the lake, we find these silty loam soils uh, that are glacial lake sediments. And then as you move up into the steeper slopes and at higher elevations, the soils become a lot more gravelly or stony. And uh, in a short period of time, this block of Cabernet Franc at the Turtle Rock Farms Vineyard has really proven to be a great site for the variety. It's a one acre block of Cabernet Franc that was planted in 2006, uh, and they are working with a Cabernet Franc clone 214, that's the Loire clone. And then this block here is on a, a western facing exposure. We're on a relatively steep slope here, and we're almost right smack dab in the middle of the narrow, narrow Mata bench, and we're about 460 meters above sea level, and we're inland, I would say, about 470 meters or so uh, inland from, uh, from the shoreline here. And then in terms of soils, uh, we have a gravelly uh, soil here with uh, clay loam in terms of uh, the, the topsoil, uh, and then the bedrock is, uh, is granite. And actually, actually, uh, actually, I should say, Alan uh, sort of explained to me that um, the specificities of this site has become really great for, or is important for Cabernet Franc uh, for one particular reason, or at least a few particular reasons. Uh, but most importantly, it's this wide diurnal range uh, and the drop in temperatures, and really he said that the exchange of airflow between the lake and the foothills and this diurnal range means that they are getting very long hang time uh, into the fall at moderate uh, sugar levels. And that gives a good tannin development, a good tannin ripeness, phenolic development, but that also helps to preserve Cabernet Franc's uh, varietal character, uh, which of course we know is an important part of the grape variety. So from a winemaking perspective, there is definitely a few things, oops, <laughs> a few things that I do want to note here uh, about this particular uh, wine. So we are dealing with hand harvested fruit and most importantly, this is a hundred percent whole cluster fermentation. Uh, so 
whole cluster fermentation in open top fermenters. Uh, and Alan will do uh, some pigeage uh, by foot at the beginning to release the juices. And then he'll hand turn the clusters uh, twice daily uh, over the course of the fermentation. The fermentation is done with indigenous yeast and the temperature sits at about, uh, about uh, 20 to 25 or so degrees Celsius during the fermentation. Uh, and Alan will taste the, uh, the fermenting must over the course of this time, uh, twice daily, and once the tannins have softened, then that's when he will go to press. And generally this is between uh, 25 uh, to 35 days uh, total. And then once the wine has been pressed, uh, it is then transferred into uh, 225 liter French oak barrels, 80% of which is new, and it rests there for around uh, 22 or so months before bottling. Now I know what you are thinking, Allison, Cabernet Franc, whole cluster, you're taking a grape that already has green tendencies and you're fermenting it on the stems, which can be green and astringent. This is a recipe for disaster. And I get it. You have every right to, <laughs> to question this, but I think with the right site, with the right approach, uh, there, there can be some really interesting things with regards to whole cluster fermentation in Cabernet Franc. I, my, lim my experience, I should say, is a little bit limited with uh, this approach for Cabernet Franc, but I have had some examples and it can be really uh, quite, quite interesting from an aromatics perspective, from a textual perspective. Um, so I am, I, I am, you know, I am not doubting this uh, technique at all. It just really requires a lot of uh, know-how and knowledge as far as the site and then, of course, uh, the approach to, uh, to fermentation. And uh, Alan explained to me that, uh, you know, his choice for whole cluster is not uh, absolute. He will taste the stems uh, before making a decision. And he said that he's tasted fully lignified brown stems that are green and astringent. And he's also tasted green stems that have a sandalwood or like a rose note in them. So the color of the stems does not necessarily dictate uh, the flavor profile that might come from the stem. So he always makes sure that he will taste the stems in advance of making his decision with regards to fermentation. So, without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's get into this wine. Mm. So, immediately it is showing hallmarks of uh, whole cluster fermentation in that it is very lifted and very perfumed. And really what leaps out of the glass first is floral notes, which I absolutely love. I am getting some purple flowers, there's some rose here as well, very fragrant. And the fruit profile is really quite lovely. Red fruit driven for sure. Uh, sweeter fruits, I would say, more cherry. There's a little bit of a red plum thing here. There's also a little bit of a raspberry note as well. And I gotta say, the pyrazines are pretty dialed back and they're by no means, I would not describe them as herbaceous at all. Very savory in a way, uh, but herbal almost, but definitely not herbaceous by no means overtly green. There's like a there's like a evergreen element to it, like evergreen trees. Kind of reminds me of um, almost like standing in a, an old growth uh, coniferous forest or something like that, where you have this plethora of evergreen trees. You've got pine trees, spruce trees, cedar trees, uh, you know, you name it, they're here. And you get the combination of the, uh, the needles, you know, the fresh needles, but also the needles that have perhaps fallen to the forest floor. So it's kind of that combination, but that's really the, um, the savoriness that I'm picking up in this wine, in addition to the floral notes as well. The nose is actually a little bit spicy as well. Yeah, a little bit of like a juniper note. There's a touch of allspice here as well, but I gotta say the nose is really, really quite pretty. Uh, very pure fruited, red fruit driven, and oh, that perfume is just fantastic. Now, oh, on the palate, all those same fruits come through really nicely. That spiciness is a little bit more pronounced on the palate as well. I had noted earlier, like a little bit of a fenugreek thing. It's kind of since um, dissipated a little bit with a bit of oxygen, but the spice profile on this is nice. Actually, maybe a little bit more of a pink peppercorn note now, uh, actually with a little bit, a uh, little bit of oxygen. Mm. Yeah, and the florals come through really nicely as well. The acidity is very bright, very lively super vibrant there's almost a juiciness as well to the profile of the acidity mm. the tannins are fantastic they're super super finely woven very silky in the mouth 
And I gotta say, the integration of the wood here with the fruit is phenomenal. Um, there's very little oak influence, overt uh, oak influence here. I noted like a little bit of a light roast coffee thing going on, but otherwise, you know, the oak and the fruit is beautifully in balance and it's really quite, uh, quite remarkable actually. Mm. Yeah, nice structure here. There's some good aging potential. I do like where it's at though currently in terms of the overall fruit profile and uh, where it's currently sitting. It's a medium weight, so nice, nice uh, breadth to the middle palette as well here. Great structure. I do like, as I said, I do think that the uh, tannins are really nicely integrated and in how the wood and the fruit are all kind of working together. There's a real uh, luminosity uh, to this wine. Uh, I'm getting like a little bit of like a, there's a bit of that resinous, sappy kind of sapidity thing going on here as well. But I just do love the texture and I do love the profile and it's, I think it's a really actually stupendous wine. And um, my experience to date actually with uh, Cabernet Franc from uh, the Okanagan Valley has been uh, styles that are uh, on the riper side with uh, more a stronger oak influence and uh, definitely more in that Bordeaux camp. And this I think has a little bit more of a note or a note to the Loire or a nod to the Loire I should say. And it is quite elegant, very finesse driven, and it's it's just delicious. And it's a great introduction actually to Alan's approach with, uh, with Cabernet Franc, and I hope I get the chance to taste more in the future. And if you have had a chance to taste any Cabernet Franc from the Okanagan Valley or anywhere else in British Columbia, do let me know who the producer was and what you thought of the wine in the comments below. And of course, as always, I will be back again soon with another wine. Cheers.